Our scripture passage today comes from the gospel according to Matthew. This is chapter 10, verses 26 to 33. Before we read this, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Our good and wonderful Father, our giver of all good gifts, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for the word that is proclaimed throughout all creation, Lord, through, through the rain, through the storm, through the flowers and the stars of the sky. We thank you for the word that has been poured into our hearts through the witness of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for this word, Lord, written out in the words of Scripture, your guidance, your truth given to us, Lord. And fathers, we come here today, we pray that, Lord, the same spirit that inspired these words would inspire us again today, Lord. And we ask your Holy Spirit, move in our hearts and our minds, that we may hear, that we may read, and that we may understand your perfect will for our lives. Father, bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 10, verses 26 to 33. Listen now to the word of the Lord. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men... I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So how many of you here today have heard of something called Pascal's Wager? Am I familiar with that? Not many gamblers out there? No? That, that's okay, that's okay. It's really not about gambling anyway. Anyway, Pascal's Wager is one of the famous, some people call it proofs for the existence of God, but it's actually not a proof for the existence of God. It is a reason why we should believe in God. And it's called Pascal's Wager. It was named after a famous mathematician by the name of Blase Pascal, and he was one of those rare mathematical prodigies who was just, just sheer genius. And as a young man, he made a lot of wonderful contributions to the science of mathematics. But when he was a little bit older, he underwent this massive spiritual conversion. And from that point on, dedicated his genius to proving that God existed. And he, and he wrote this apologetic, it is called the Pensies. And in this book, we have what is called Pascal's Wager. Now, Pascal's Wager goes something like this. If you believe in God, and there ends up not being a God, the consequences are far less, are far less dire than if you didn't believe in God, and there ended up being a God. He put it this way, describe it again. Okay, let's say you're a Christian, you believe in God, and it turns out to be all wrong. What's the worst that happens to you? You lived a good Christian moral life, and you're just as dead as the atheist. However, take the other way around. If you're an unbeliever, and you go your whole life not believing in God, and then you die and you come to find out that there is a God, now you're in trouble. Now you're in trouble because you lived your life all wrong the entire way there. So the consequences of believing and there not being a God is far less than the consequences of not believing and they're actually being a God. That is the content of Pascal's wager. And it's actually a kind of kind of brilliant way to think about it. He's, he's right. You cannot fault his logic. However, however, there's something we don't like about the idea of our faith being a wager. 
of our faith being a gamble, that we're just using our logic and saying, well, it's better to believe and not be a God than to believe, and they're actually to be a God, so I'm going to go ahead and believe in God because the odds are backing me here on this one. We don't really think of our faith like that, and, and it really shouldn't be like that. I mean, faith shouldn't be like we're sitting at the, the giant roulette table of the gods, and we're just going to spin, and we hope that we put our, our money on the right number. And some kind of even think of it like that. In the, in, the, in the pagan world, it was popular, and they would believe in lots of different gods, hoping that they could get the right one. And some people still think of it as a roulette table, you know, and that the best thing to do is to believe, to put our money on a few gods, hoping one of them is going to be right. I'm going to put a little bit of money on Allah here, a little bit of money on Buddha, and maybe, just maybe, because you never know, a little bit on Zeus. You never know what might happen. And hopefully when that, when that, when that wheel spins and the ball lands, I would have picked the right God. Of course, we're not allowed to do that anyway. As Christians, we believe in a religion that is called an exclusive one. As in, once you pick this God, you can't pick any others. You've got to put all your money on one. And God says that, I am a jealous God. You can't have no other gods before me. Once you pick me, he's the only God. The only one you believe in, the only one you trust in, the only one you pray to, the only one that you have faith in. The whole shebang. The whole shebang goes on him. It's all on Jesus. Everything on red seven, baby. Come on. Give me red seven. In fact, we put everything we have on Jesus Christ. Our whole life. Everything is backing him as the one true God. Seems like quite the gamble. Think of it that way. Of all the gods out there, you're putting all your money on one. And I think Jesus knew he was asking a lot of us. And that from our human perspective, it might seem like an incredibly risky wager. So today Jesus here is encouraging his disciples. And he's hoping to, to bolster their faith and to build them up in their belief. You see, he had just warned them about a lot of persecution coming. He said, if you're my disciple, you're going to have a hard time. People are going to hate you. They're going to revile you. They're going to persecute you. Some of you will be thrown in prison. Some of you will be killed because of me. Some of you will be turned over by your own family. I'll give you to authorities and kill you all for my sake. He said, be careful, I'm sending you out like sheep amongst a wild and ravenous pack of wolves. But, but, he continues on in this passage we read today, I don't want you to be scared. Don't be scared, he says, do not fear them. And the them he's talking about is, of course, anyone who would persecute you, anyone who would hate you, anyone who would revile you for the name of Christ. He says, don't be scared of them. Don't be scared of what they're going to say or what they're going to do. I want you to proclaim boldly. Go out there, shout it from the rooftops. Anything that's spoken in the dark, you're going to shout it off in the day. Everything that is now hidden is going to be revealed. And I don't want you to be scared of anything they can do to you. Because the worst they can do, the absolute worst they can do to you, is kill you. That's it. That's it. Just kill you. Sounds pretty bad, but he reminds us there's someone who can do even worse than that. All they can do is kill the body. He says, but you shouldn't fear them. Fear the one who can actually kill the body and destroy the soul in hell. He's talking about God, of course. But he's not saying this to the disciples in order that they would be afraid. And this passage so much of the do not fear those who kill the body, but only fear the one who can kill the body and the soul in hell. That passage is used so much to frighten people and to say, listen, you need to believe in God because he can destroy your body and your soul. But Jesus here wasn't trying to frighten his disciples. He was trying to encourage them. He was trying to take away their fear. Because he was saying the one you believe in is more powerful than these ones down here and all they can do is kill your body. But that's all they can do. The one I'm asking you to trust is more powerful than that. Because he not only gave life to your body, he can give life to your soul as well. So he's trying to, to, to allay the fear and the uncertainty of the disciples who are putting everything behind Jesus. They're giving their whole life and every single one of them except for the Apostle John was required to give his life. So Christ is trying to give him strength. 
and breathing faith and breathing hope into their lives by reminding them the God you serve is the God that can not only take a body, but take a soul as well. And then he gives us this beautiful illustration about the sparrow. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? He says, they're cheap. We have sparrows all over the place. The, the sky's full of the sparrows. The trees are full of sparrows. My, my bird feeder is full of sparrows. And yet your God sees every single one of them. And not a single sparrow falls, it says, apart from your father. So he's not a God that's distant. This God who can destroy both the body and the soul, who can give life to both the body and the soul. This God is not distant. He's not watching from afar. He's watching every single sparrow that falls. And not a single one can fall that is apart from his plan, apart from his will, apart from his control that he still controls over this earth and over our life and over everything. And he says, my friends, aren't you more important than sparrows? That your God who watches over, this God, the king of life and death, watches over every single sparrow who has numbered every single hair in your head. He can tell you exactly how many of mine have gone gray and how many are still their natural color. The exact proportion of them. This is the God that watches over you. This is the God that cares for you still. Still, it seems like a big gamble to us. I mean, we know God does this, but from here, from our earthly perspective, it seems like an awful big gamble to put everything we have, especially from the demands that the Christian life asks of us, to give up so much, to be so different, to walk against the grain, to swim upstream sometimes. It's an awful big gamble to put our whole life on this one hope. Except when we get to the uh, end of Jesus' speech here, we find out that this gamble is not what we thought it was. We find out after Jesus is done here that he gambles as much on us as we gamble on him. Or in fact, he gambles a lot more on us than we ever gamble on him. Listen to how he ends this passage here. Verse 32 and 33. He says, Everyone... Who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So you acknowledge me before others, acknowledge me before men, and I'm going to acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven. In other words, gamble on me, and I'll gamble on you. And this is a promise not made to his disciples. Notice who he says can do this. He says, anyone, anyone who acknowledges me before men, not certain people, not just the disciples, anyone who acknowledges me before men, anyone who stands up publicly and says, Christ is Lord, he says, one day I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. As in, if you say, I belong to Jesus, and this is a public, this is not something just in your head or just in your heart. This is a public confession, which is why we make a big deal of public confessions here. When you join the church, you stand up in front of everybody and you say it with your mouth so everybody can hear, I belong to Jesus Christ. And the deal he offers is us is that if you say, I belong to Jesus Christ, one day when you stand before my Father in heaven and he looks down on you and says, who are you? Jesus will stand up and say, he belongs to me. She belongs to me. They're one of mine. I've bought them with my blood. It's a pretty good deal. It's a pretty good deal, and we actually get the much, much better end of it. It appears if anyone's doing it a gamble, anyone's making a wager, it's Jesus. He's gambling on us. He's put a wager on you and he's put a wager on me that one day we are going to be ready for the kingdom of heaven. I want you to notice not only what Jesus says in here, but what he doesn't say. He said, anyone who acknowledges me, I will acknowledge him. But what does he not say here? He doesn't say, notice here, if you do right, then I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. doesn't say it. 
He doesn't say, if you obey everything I say, then and only then will I acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. He doesn't say, if you can show to me and if you can prove to me that you can be a good person, if you can do that, then I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. He doesn't say, if you can show me that you can be a good Christian person and do all the good Christian things and say all the good Christian things and dress like a good Christian and act like a good Christian, if you can do that, then I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. He doesn't even say, just be a nice person, okay? Just go out there, be a nice person, don't be a jerk to people. If you can just do that, just do that, then I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. He doesn't say any of those things. He just says, if you will just acknowledge me, tell other people that you belong to me, don't be ashamed of the fact, don't hide the fact, tell people you belong to me, and one day I will tell God that you belong to me too. He just lacks requirements here, okay? I mean, this is not an exclusive club. All you have to do is acknowledge Christ before others. I mean, what kind of riffraff is going to be coming through the doors if that is your only requirement? What's heaven going to look like, you think, if all you have to do, anybody, anybody can just acknowledge Christ as their Lord and now they can get into the kingdom of heaven? I mean, it's not going to look like the country club we think heaven normally looks like. Yeah, the elite the nice people, the good people, the cream of the crop, the very top shelf human beings that have done the right things and said the right things and lived the kind of life we're supposed to live. That's not what it looks like here. This looks more like a public school. I mean, they're letting anybody in. You got their address? Okay, come on in. We'll take you. This is people from all over. All kinds are going to be getting in now. You're going to have the educated with the illiterate, the rich with the poor, the refined with the uncouth. The civilized mixing with the barbaric, the clean, rubbing elbows with the unwashed on the streets of heavenly gold. And it may be even worse than that. If all you have to do is acknowledge Christ before others, anybody could get in. It could be thieves and murderers. You could let in prostitutes and pornographers. They could be drug traffickers coming in and slave ship captains. You could have far-off leftist radicals and reactionary racists. This is your only requirement. Gosh, even politicians might come in. Who knows what's going to happen now? This is quite the wager that Jesus is making. Think about this. All of these sinners, any sinner out there, I'm wagering that I can make them suitable for the kingdom. That's the bet he's making on us. Jesus has come and he's wagered that I can take the lowest and the most despicable humanity. I can get down there and I can scrape out the bottom of the barrel. And I can make them into children of God. What a gamble that is. Jesus here, he's not saying, give me your elite, give me your educated, give me your good and your holy and righteous and I'll make them into a kingdom. He says, I mean, give me the arrogant and the proud. Give me the depraved and the criminal. I'll take the most hateful and the stingiest people among you. I'll take even the perverse and I'll take the twisted and I'm going to make them into sons and daughters of the kingdom. Anybody who acknowledges me. I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. He's taking all the applicants. Easiest interview you'll ever go through. You want to be a part of this program of being in the kingdom of God? Tell me, will you acknowledge me before others? Yep, all right, you're in, done, that's it. Interview's over. You're in. Yeah, Jesus gambled. He could take all these people and turn them into children. And he believed in it so much that he gave his life for it. That's the risk he took on you and me. That's the risk he took on when he gambled on us. He believed that you were so worth it. He believed you were so worth this wager that he was going to put his life on the saving of yours. 
He believed so much and was so confident that you could become a true child of God that he bet his life on you. And I don't know about you, but when I think of me and I'm like, man, that was risky. Bet your life on me. I mean, I know what I can, I'm capable of and I can disappoint. Believe me, there is no expectation so low that I can't disappoint it. He's made a huge wager on me, but that's what he did. You know, it seems like we gamble on God, but it's really not that much of a wager, is it? I mean, it's very unlikely that the God who can see every sparrow that falls and knows and numbers every hair upon our heads will ever forget about us or will ever fail to keep up his end of the bargain. Now, in this wager, the greater risk is that we fail to live up to our part. The greater risk is that we'll ever really be worthy of the blood that Christ poured into us. But it was a gamble he made. It was a risk that Jesus thought, Jesus knew, was a good one to take. But in the end, i got to say, he's not really betting on us. Jesus isn't really betting on us on all. He's betting on grace. In the end, what Jesus is betting on is that God's love is going to be stronger than our sin. And if you've seen the full force of God's love, and nobody here has seen the full force of God's love, in fact, the only one I know that's ever walked the earth that saw the full force of God's love was Jesus Christ himself. And if you have seen the full force of God's love, you'll know it is not a bet at all. Betting on God's love to overcome our sin is like betting on a tidal wave to knock over a sandcastle. There's no contest. There's no way that sandcastle can stand. And all the, while, all the while we're sitting in our little sandcastles looking at the sin that we built and be like, oh, there's no way God can forgive this. There's no way the sandcastle of my sin is so mighty, it's so tall, it's so great. How can God possibly ever forgive this? And maybe you've had great and mighty sins, I don't know. Maybe you've built this giant edifice of sin, but at the end of the day it's just a sandcastle compared to the power. God's love for you. And we build this mighty sandcastle of sin and we wonder how we can ever overcome it. And Jesus is saying, just give me a chance. Just open the door. Acknowledge me before others. And I'll show you what I can do. And we'll wash this sandcastle away. And when the tide goes out again, no one will ever know that it was here at all. Have no fear, our Lord says. Do not be afraid to put everything you've got on Christ. Proclaim it from the rooftops. Cry it out in the day. Acknowledge Christ as the Lord of your life. And he will make his grace the rule of yours. And that, my friends, is a wager that we will win every single time. To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.